Let's just take, for example, simple Super Bowl. In reality, when you have a bouncy ball, whether it's a Super Bowl, a basketball, um, a tennis ball, whatever it is, and that and you drop that ball from rest, so we drop it from rest, V0 equals zero, it does speed up towards the ground and it bounces off the ground. Now think about what happens during the collision with the ground. Think about the energy and momentum conservation processes that are going on. When the ball reaches the ground, it is going its fastest. Right? We can just let's just call that V final, the, this velocity when it reaches the ground. When it hits the ground, at some point during the collision with the ground, it's too hard for me to keep on redrawing this ball, it comes to a stop, right? At some intermediate point, the ball comes to a stop. And then it turns around and it goes back up. So what happens is, is it exchanges momentum with the ground and then the ground is sort of, the ground gives it back that momentum or the energy is stored as potential energy as the ground and the ball squish. And that potential energy, if it's stored in a conservative force, if the ball can be treat and ground can be treated as ideal springs, then we can say that it's conservative. And when it bounces up off the ground, all the energy is given back. And if it's a perfectly conservative force, then the, when the ball comes off the ground, it is going to have the same velocity from right before it hit the ground, right? So if Ke is conserved in the collision with the ground, therefore, the velocity of the ball after the collision, Vf, uh, we, I called it Vf in both cases, speed after the collision with the ground is equal to the speed before the collision with the ground. That's hence the Vf being the velocity at the ground. Um, it's got the same speed in either direction before and after the collision. Uh, let's see, yeah. V after the collision with the ground is equal to V before the collision with the ground. If the kinetic energy is conserved in the collision, that is, if the ball is perfectly squishy, um, perfectly elastic, right? It's got a perfect ideal spring um, that, that the ball and the ground are made out of, then all the energy can be given back. And then how high will the ball bounce? Well, you know from kinematics or energy conservation that if the ball if the ball's velocity right before it hit the ground was VF, and right after it bounces off the ground is VF, then it must go back up to the same height. It must go back up to the same height from where it started. So if it falls a height H, it's gonna go back up a height H. If the velocity right before it hits the ground is equal to the speed, sorry, speed, not velocity, because the direction changes, the speed right after it hits the ground. It's got to go back up to the same height. I hope that's clear. It's got to go back up to the same height. You can just you can figure that out from um, energy conservation, right? The the work done by gravity on the way down is equal to mgh, and if all the energy is given back, then the work done by gravity on the way up must equal minus mg. Well, mg that's that, that's h initial, that's h final, and so therefore h initial must equal h final, and so it's going to go back up. So. We could call that h initial and that h final. It's going to go back up to the same height it started from if the kinetic energy is conserved in the collision with the ground. So now go outside or inside, go grab a bouncy ball and drop it and see does it come back up to the same height that from where you dropped it? And the answer is no, it never does. Why doesn't it? The answer is because kinetic energy is not conserved in the collision with the ground that the ball and the ground are not ideal springs and some energy is lost. So it is a bouncing collision which is not ideal and it is partially elastic or partially inelastic, both of them mean the same thing, um, or it's just a, a bouncing collision where it loses some energy. It is a bouncing collision, they don't stick together, the ball doesn't stick to the ground, um, but it's a, a, a sticking collision which loses some energy. If the ball doesn't come back to the same height, some kinetic energy must be lost in the collision with the ground. Therefore, it's not and it's a not elastic. It's not perfectly elastic, certainly, or you can say partially. It's a partially elastic bouncing collision. But if you get a really good bouncy ball, like a kickball or a super ball, and you try to drop it from a certain height, you'll find it comes almost back up to the same height. So it's 
almost a perfectly elastic collision. And maybe we can just, uh, we can just uh, idealize those kinds of collisions as being pretty close to perfectly elastic. So we can talk about perfectly elastic collisions where the energy is conserved and inelastic collisions where energy is not conserved. Let's just talk about one other kind of uh, ball, which is perhaps let's talk about maybe a piece of clay. Let's make this blue ball a piece of clay. What happens when you drop a piece of clay on the ground? Well, depending on what kind of clay, but you might imagine that that clay simply sticks to the ground. It doesn't bounce at all. It sticks to the ground. It may stick to the ground and not bounce at all. So you drop it, plop, it just sticks and you know, it doesn't bounce. So what kind of collision is that, right? That is a perfectly inelastic collision. It is a sticking collision, inelastic sticking collision. All the energy is lost in that collision. All Ke is lost, right? And we say lost, right? It, the energy still goes somewhere, but it's lost in heat to the ground and to the ball. All the kinetic energy is lost. And, doesn't, and in a sticking collision, it's not necessary that all the kinetic energy is lost. That is not a property of a sticking collision. But in the case of dropping a piece of sticky clay on the floor, all your kinetic energy is lost to heat. Um, but it just a sticking collision or an inelastic collision simply means that kinetic energy is not conserved. The primary difference between a, 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 an elastic collision and an inelastic collision that you need to know is that in elastic collision, energy is conserved. In an inelastic collision, energy is not conserved. And the kinds of collisions we've seen so far were all inelastic. Right? When we talk about um, a car hitting a moose and the moose uh, be landing on the windshield of the car, um, that was an inelastic collision where kinetic energy had to have been lost. The car and the moose heat up before the moose uh, just gets angry and runs away. Problem. Let's say that in an amusement park bumper car ride, Jack's car is going at three meters per second east. Jack has a one-dimensional collision, so we don't have to worry about two dimensions and taking vector components. Um, Jack has a one-dimensional collision with Jill, who's at rest initially. If the collision is elastic, which might be an approximation, right? What is the speed of Jill's car after the collision? Assume that the mass of each car and rider are the same. Um, well, that's going to be pretty close because even though Jack and Jill may be different sizes, those cars are much more massive. And so the, the car's mass really uh, is, is what dominates here. And so the masses are about the same. Okay, so here's the, here's the, here's the picture, right? So we've got Jack... We'll just call, I just made it one and two instead of Jack and Jill since they both start with J. So this is Jack and this is Jill. Jill is sitting still and Jack is heading towards Jill at V1, three meters, meters per second. After the collision, I don't know what direction Jack's going in. Jack might have bounced back in that direction. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. We can just say Jack's velocity is V1 prime, V1 final. Jill's velocity is V2 prime. V2 final. And if Jack is actually going in the opposite direction, Jill has to be going in the, to the right. Hopefully that's obvious. But if Jack bounces back to the left, then we're just going to find V1 prime is negative. So we're going to define the plus x direction in that direction. Momentum is a vector, so we've got to define a plus x direction for momentum. And we can go ahead and write down momentum conservation. If we choose plus x, then we can say, okay, p total initial is equal to p total final because this is, and I'm just going to use uh, unprimed and prime for initial and final. Um, momentum is conserved in a collision unless we say otherwise, right? Or because there's no net external forces or because it happens inst instantaneously. So then we can say that m1 v1 is in the plus x direction. So I can just say it's positive v1. And I'm not going to bother writing down the vectors because it's one dimensional, right? So I don't have to write down i and j. Um, but I guess, you know, we would normally do that, m1, v1, 0 for Jill equals m1, v1 prime in the x direction plus m2, v2 prime in the plus x direction. They're all moving in the plus x direction. Um, and because it's one dimensional, the, the, we don't have to worry about the i's. And so what we end up getting is v1 equals v1 prime plus v2 prime. You say, well, but how's that helpful? Well, so we do know V1, right? V1 is 3 meters per second. 3 meters per second. But I don't know what V1 prime and V2 prime are. 
but because it is an elastic collision, I can also conserve energy. Because it's an elastic collision, I can say that the total kinetic energy of the system before the collision, one half m1v1 squared plus one half m2v2 squared, equals the total kinetic energy after the collision, just put primes on the velocities. Now, remember, the masses are the same. I just uh, wrote a general kinetic energy conservation formula here. But the masses are the same, so they cancel. The one halves are the same, so they cancel. The velocity of Jill initially is zero, so this is zero. And so what we end up getting, so I'm just going to remember for the next page, we had V1 from the momentum conservation, we had that. And from the energy conservation, we've got everything else cancels. We've got V1 squared equals V1 prime squared plus V2 prime squared. That's what we've got. And remember, we know that V1 is 3 meters per second. And so we have two unknowns, and we've got two equations. And so we've got to solve these together. It's kind of a pain because it ends up being a quadratic, but it's now just algebra to solve for V1 prime and V2 prime. I'm going to do out the algebra and then come back. One step, I took the momentum conservation equation and I just solved for one of the unknowns, V1 prime. Remember, V1 is known. I'm just not plugging it in yet. Solve for one of the unknowns and then I'm plugging it into the energy conservation equation. Solving so that in the energy conservation, since V1 is a known, this is a known, then we only have one unknown quantity. And so we need to solve this equation for V2 prime. So we now just uh, multi we square the quantity in the, in the parentheses and we bring everything over to one side so that we have a quadratic because remember the unknown here is V2 prime. So we've got uh, V2 prime squared, V2 prime to the first, and then a constant. So this is a quadratic equation where this is A, and this is B, and this is C, right? That's your quadratic equation so that... So it's algebra that's now, now V1 is three, and so we can just plug three into this to figure out what V2 prime is. You, I'm sure you caught a long, long ago that I left off a squared up here, darn it, left off a squared there. That was silly. So I left off the squared everywhere there on the left, and then it turns out that because um, this is a squared, right, C is actually equal to zero, and so while we can still plug in to the quadratic equation, it's not actually quad, uh, we don't have to because we could have just factored out a V2. Um, and what we would find is uh, we get six plus six is 12 divided by four is three. We get V2 is, prime is three meters per second. So an option of V2 prime equals zero meters per second. But it turns out that this is a non-physical solution Right? That's just not possible, because if V2 prime is zero, that means that V1 kept all of its velocity, yet V1 is still traveling in the plus x direction. It would still have a velocity of plus 3 meters per second, but it doesn't move, uh, the jack doesn't move through Jill. It means that jack would have had to, um, I don't know what you call it, um, not beam through, but you know, would have to move through Jill and keep moving. That doesn't make any sense. So that's a non-physical solution. So the physical solution is that Jill gets a velocity of three meters per second. Oh, and what does that mean Jack gets? So we didn't ask what Jack's final velocity was, but if Jill's final velocity is three meters per second, then Jack's final velocity is what? Well, we, got, we can look back and say, if Jack's initial velocity was three and Jill's final velocity is three, then what's Jack's final velocity? Must be zero. Jack comes to a stop. So what happens is that Jack transfers all of his momentum to Jill. If it is a one-dimensional, perfectly elastic collision, Jack hits Jill, he transfers all of his momentum to Jill, he stops, and she goes on. If you've ever been in a bumper car, you might have experienced this before, where you are running into, you, you, go and you go to hit somebody who is sitting still, and basically they go off at a velocity and you come to a stop. That's not actually unusual. Okay, but that's an example of an elastic collision where I made a mathematical error and hopefully you all caught it. Okay, bye-bye.